A very warm welcome to everyone who has joined us um, at the first Sankal Dialogue, which we're doing in collaboration with the School World Forum. Um, given the circumstances, uh, thank you so much for showing interest and joining us here in a very critical conversation that we are having with uh, seven expert panel members uh, from different parts of the ecosystem. Um, first of all, we hope that each one of you and your families and your friends are safe and healthy. Yeah, can we see a thumbs up or a nod? That everyone yes. is doing well? Brilliant. Well, thank you so much. Uh, the session is titled Sustainable Textiles and Vulnerable Communities. Um, what we are going to focus on today is, and I'll come to a little bit more uh, context later uh, in this conversation, but uh, what we want to focus on uh, along with our uh, special panel is this whole thing of how do we not lose sight of tomorrow while we are focused on managing the challenges and the impact that we see unfolding from the current crisis of coronavirus. Um, to start with, my name is Venkat Kodamaraju. I'm the director for Circular Apparel Innovation Factory. Uh, we are an initiative uh, <laughs> under IntelliCap. Circular Apparel Innovation Factory is an industry-led platform. And um, right from our inception, we have been trying to drive the momentum around building an ecosystem and capabilities to accelerate the transition of the apparel and textile industry in India towards circularity. That's a pretty ambitious mission that we've set for ourselves. Um, and we are building the ecosystem really to search, feed, support and scale circular textile and apparel innovations across India. And to be able to do this, we leverage the Avishkar Group approach of creating impact at scale by providing access to capital, knowledge and networks all through the innovator's journey. We have the pleasure of being supported by <coughs> Duman Foundation and Aditya Birla Fashion and Retail both of whom are the anchor partners at CIS, and they've been with us all the way from our early days. So thank you so much again for Doom Foundation and Abhi Tabela Fashion and Retail. Um, this session is the first Sankal Dialogue that we are doing in collaboration with the World, uh, the School World Forum. So for all our friends and partners uh, at School Forum, a big shout out and a thank you for having us. Uh, it's a pleasure. Um, and we look forward to more collaborations and partnerships with you in the future. Now, um, as we all know, we just over three months back, um, as we all took our first steps into 2020, it really marked the beginning of a pivotal decade of action for making progress towards the United Nations 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. And in half the time, and in the less than three months that we've had in the 2020, the world is reeling under the COVID-19 crisis. What started as a health crisis in one country, as you know, has now engulfed almost every country in this world and has very quickly transpired from a health crisis into one which is truly a humanitarian crisis. There is absolutely no doubt, and we could possibly, um, I could be guilty of stating the obvious, but uh, we are living in extraordinary times, uh, which has fundamentally changed the way we live, the way we work, the way we are interacting, the way we are consuming, and in a lot more ways. Let's make no mistake that we are witnessing history being made and written today. But the question for all of us, for those on the panel who have joined us, and for the rest of the audience who is registered and listening in at the background, the question is, do we want, no matter what role we play, no matter what organizations we are part of, no matter what shape or form our work takes, do we want to remain as mere witnesses to this history that's unfolding in front of us? Or is there something that we should be doing individually and collectively to shape the history? So essentially, along with the panel, what we will be aiming for by the end of this conversation is to come up with a very early blueprint 
or perhaps even insights that could help us put together the blueprint on two things. Number one, what could we do collectively as an industry, as an ecosystem to help mitigate the impact and the risk for the vulnerable individuals and communities who are part of this industry. Number two is we really want to see how we might be able to collaborate as an industry, as an ecosystem, to ensure that the sustainability agenda that we've fought really hard for in the last couple of years, perhaps now more than ever, is not lost to competing business priorities. So essentially, those are two key objectives for us as we move forward in this conversation. And to be able to make progress on this conversation, we have a fantastic panel. So allow me to introduce the panel for the audiences who have joined us. Um, I'm going in no particular order, so just bear with me. First up, we have uh, Dr. Naresh Tyagi, who's the Chief Sustainability Officer at Aditya Villa Fashion and Retail. Apart from leading the sustainability agenda for ADFRL, uh, he and his organization, and of course, won several awards and accolades uh, for that work. Naresh is also an active member of several industry forums and initiatives, including Sustainable Apparel Coalition, Cotton 2040, Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and several others. But more importantly, he almost feels like it almost feels like he's part of our family because he's the chair of CIF's Governance Council, and um, we've always uh, we could always lean back on his support and guidance all the way through our journey. Second, we have. Gigi Matthews, who is the Director, India for Venture Development at NBU. At NBU, they build profitable and scalable ventures that address social and environmental issues and drive market development. At the panel, she represents and shares the perspective of numerous enterprises that they work with at various stages of development, as well as give or take on its impact on the social entrepreneurship ecosystem as a whole. Then we have Louis Perkins, who is the president at Apparel Impact Institute. Louis leads the organization which has been launched by brands and apparel sector industry associations to really identify fund scale programs to drive positive impact on the fashion sector. He's also been consulting with several organizations and corporations on their social and environmental program development. Next on our panel is Sangeeta Roira, who is the president for sourcing and production at the House of Anita Dongre. As you might already know, House of Anita Dongre, one of India's well-established fashion houses, is especially known for its work that they do with the local and underprivileged craftswomen. Um, some of you might already know this, but in the wake of the corona crisis, they've already announced the medical fund for the workers that they work with. Sangeeta brings to the panel a perspective from the front lines of sustainable humane fashion. Then we have Catherine Lay, who's the managing director for Fashion and Fashion for Good. Catherine drives the Fashion for Good global efforts to enable daring invention and widespread adoption of good fashion practice. And she's done this by harnessing the power of innovation, practical action, and cross-sector collaboration to drive the transition towards the circular apparel and textile industry. Then we have Stefano Funari, who is the founder and managing director of I Was Ostari. I Was Ostari is a zero dividend initiative, and it's a triple bottom line focus nonprofit, which is dedicated to upcycling waste while empowering low-income craftsmen from the urban slums in Mumbai. Stefano joins us to discuss the impact of the ongoing health crisis from the perspective of enterprises and the organized workforce and the unorganized workforce. And last but not the least, we have Ipshita Sinha, who is the program manager at Laudus Foundation. At Laudus, she leads the labor rights panel and brings in the lens on the human from a human impact on the crisis <laughs> and the disparities in social security nets among the informal, contractual, and home-based sectors, home-based workers from the sector. Once again, thank you so much for each of our panel members to join us in this critical conversation. Mm -hmm. The first question is, could you tell us, could you share with us some of the 
top ways in which the current COVID or the coronavirus crisis is impacting your businesses. Either directly, if you are an active player in the value chain, or indirectly for the, the partners or enterprises and stakeholders that you work with. And I would encourage you to share just some of the top of the mind uh, ways in which the crisis is impacting the business. If I could start with uh, Sangeeta, could you share a couple of points on how the, the business is getting up? Being a retail brand, uh, we have uh, more than 1,000 sale points across uh, India. So obviously our business is usually affected. I mean, absolutely every single store is shut. So to us, that is, I mean, that's the biggest crisis with everything shut. We don't know for how long, even post, uh, post this entire episode, uh, one really doesn't know how and when things are going to bounce back to normal. Uh, I think that itself is the biggest issue. Two is uh, we have been sourcing uh, to some extent from China, etc. So all of those had to be diverted <laughs> to other places. I mean, and we had to rehaul our entire uh, supply chain and move orders elsewhere uh, to combat right. this because China wasn't in a good state. Okay. Uh, I think predominantly these two. And of course, we are all working from home as of now, like the rest of the world. Okay. Um, Narish, uh, could I come to you on uh, how for you to share how the crisis is impacting your business? Sure. Uh, thanks. Hi, everyone. Am I audible? Loud and clear, Narish. Yeah. For us, uh, we being a retailer in India, I think uh, we are impacted uh, everywhere in value chain from retail side to manufacturing side to even. Uh, uh, supplying side. Uh, we are badly hit uh, in terms of because entire operation is closed. Only office and corporate team work from home. But we right. have almost 12,000 our own uh, worker who work in our factory. We close. We have 6,000 retail shopping shop and our EBO, everything closed office, regional office, everything closed. So we have a lot of impact uh, in this, but uh, for us, I think at this juncture, most important thing is health and safety of our pupil. And uh, even that uh, we are taking this as a top priority. Uh, only last uh, two days, we opened partial one or two line of ours to start making masks and uh, other, other thing for <laughs> local C CSR. Right. Okay. Um, Gigi, could I ask you to uh, come in with your inputs on this uh, point? Yes, thanks, Venkat. Uh, so the thing is, um, what NBU does is we build social enterprises that are built and designed for uh, scalability. Now, right. because of this crisis, which is actually a quarantine on consumption, especially in the textile industry, everything is shut down. So if you look at the ventures that we uh, build, they're all early stage startups. And uh, one of the biggest problem we face is uh, the leeway or the runway that a lot of these ventures don't have if this continues, right? Um, so that has been one of the biggest challenges. And then, uh, and also delays in a lot of our uh, ventures, like our rejuvenate, cotton rejuvenation plant, we have one pilot in Belgium, we, uh, we were making big strides in actually opening up a facility in India. <laughs> There's been a lot of delays um, on this. And uh, so, so where it impacts the most is, for example, Kaloom, one of our uh, ventures, which uh, actually works with recycled yarn to make high-end fabrics. It's a, it's a group of weavers who work with handlooms. And uh, it's been closed. And uh, so they without work, but of course, NBU has, you know, we build it from the ground up. So the kind of support um, they have it right now, but the biggest problem is the runway or the leeway that you don't have. So it's very important to bring in scenario planning, cash flow, uh, cash flow planning. So yes, thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Gigi. And I think I love what you said about the quarantine on consumption, right? Uh, and I think uh, a lot of times we speak about um, how much of what we are doing as industry players and how much the translate into, especially in this in this part of the world where we talk about how the consumers are not really asking us those questions about, um, you know, the transparency in our supply chains and the traceability and the uh, the responsible production 
uh, as we've probably seen in some of the other countries. But I love this point that you're saying about uh, the quarantine on consumption per se, right? Thank you for that. Um, uh, if you thought, could I uh, ask you to join in with uh, your perspectives on this? Um, sure, Venkat. Um, as you know, you've already said the context, the Loudest Foundation, we're not a business, but we work very closely with civil society organizations and organizations that engage with workers. Um, and as everybody has described that business has got impacted and the trickle down for that is on workers, workers who um, are not getting paid in some contexts who have gotten laid off. Um, I think the worst impact, and I speak about this, not just in the Indian context, but in the context of our program, which is across ba Bangladesh, Southeast Asia and Brazil, um, the, the double impact has been on migrant workers who have not only had to face loss of jobs, but also in a lot of contexts because they're struggling to communicate just uh, displacement from home and even access to basic services. Um, so the trickle down, uh, as we see from the Loudest Foundation's perspective, has been on the impact on the workers, both in terms of loss of occupation, but also that sense of displacement from their community. Wonderful. Thank you, Shita. Uh, Stefano, would you like to weigh in on uh, this question? Yeah, so 15 days into the lockdown, as an entrepreneur, I can, uh, I can say that something is already clear. Uh, the costs are running, so the fixed costs are there, the salaries uh, are going to be paid, and there is no production. Uh, we are not able to uh, invoice. Out of 200 people that are involved in the project, there are probably 12 to 15 that uh, can work from home, all the others are waiting to know what's going to happen. In terms of disruption going forward, I, I really expect that for us, there will be uh, a major disruption in the supply chain uh, at the beginning, uh, also because we, we primarily work with a special raw material that is represented by uh, pre-loved, pre-used Indian saris. And uh, we know already right. that that is going to be completely disrupted. We know already that uh, the sari bala, so the, the, the dealers from whom we buy the saris have uh, mostly left. They are going back, uh, they went back to the villages and we don't know uh, how that is going to work. It will take, uh, it will take really uh, time. The second major disruption that we do expect even bigger, uh, even tougher is on the demand side. So you have to consider that our main markets in terms of geography are Italy, France, UK, and then the US. And if you look at where uh, COVID-19 is really having a huge impact, you, you find uh, exactly right. those countries. Uh, right. And the second aspect is about uh, clearly the distribution, uh, where we expect that uh, the retailers through which we primarily sell our products are going to be heavily impacted by, uh, by the recession that will come. Right, no, thank you, Stefano. And I think you raised a very good point about um, the linkages of the global supply chains. And, um, and I'll just come back to that particular point uh, after we've heard from uh, Catherine and uh, Louis. Catherine, would you like to go next, please? Captain, uh, your prop, yeah, you're on mute, yeah. Okay, well, hello Please, everybody. Um, so for context, a, a bit of um, uh, background on Fashion for Good. So Fashion for Good is an innovation platform um, launched some three years ago. And um, we search for um, disruptive, uh, innovative um, startups that, that have solutions really throughout the supply chain from raw material innovation all the way through end of use. Um, all with the ambition to, to drive um, towards circularity. And we do that, obviously, scouting startups. We have now more than 19 our programs, um, and we bring them together with our um, corporate partners, and those represent um, leading brands, but also leading manufacturers. And um, we help, um, through this connection, really um, scale the efforts of, of those startups. So how has this um, well, pandemic um, impacted those, those stakeholders in our work? I guess 
um, very much along the lines as we've heard already from Anita and, and Stefano, the, the brand partners um, on our um, side are, are struggling um, with everything that you've pointed out, be it store closures, be it um, real short-term financial pressure to really um, keep the business alive. We are seeing um, layoffs um, around the world and we're also seeing obviously the, the impact on the supply side with regards to cancellation of orders and um, to a large extent though also brands really stepping in and, and paying for those um, cancelled orders. I think that's a huge um, drama that is, that is affecting Bangladesh and um, many of the producing countries right now. What that means for the brand's efforts um, to work with, with our innovators, clearly there is at this point in time um, other topics that are of priority, but um, we also see a commitment to the, to the, to the long-term efforts. Um, but clearly there is the reprioritization um, in terms of um, work that also speaks to what um, Gigi already mentioned, um, leading to some of the um, delays. If we look at our innovators, what's, what's interesting, in, in we have also um, various innovators that are um, you know, working on new materials, working on new recycling technologies. All of those um, innovators are still in a lab stage or very much still working in you know, the development and R&D phase of products. And um, fortunately, much of this R&D work can, can still continue because you don't need to have a, a strong amount of, of supply chain interaction at this stage. And we also see still um, um, positive signs from the investor community to continue to support those, those innovators. So in this um, global pandemic that led to a um, deep global recession that I think affects all of the stakeholders, there's at least with some of the, the innovative projects, um, um, some positive lights that I would also want to point out. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, and I think you make a really good point, which is uh, amongst, which is the most obvious, of course, is the, the negative impact that you're seeing across the business of all shapes and forms, but um, what I'm taking away, the positive thing that I'm taking away from uh, your points was that you still have, because a lot of us, or each one of us in our own roles, in our own line of work, we're invested in making sure that the innovations which are towards changing and the, the way we do business, the way we look at the industry as such, and a lot of these innovations which are at the R&D stage or, the, or in the lab form at the moment can continue to work. And they may not necessarily perhaps be directly impacted by the current crisis. So um, perhaps there is an opportunity for us to make sure as ecosystem enablers or as an ecosystem at large, to make sure that the, the effort on these kinds of innovations continues despite what happens on the, the economics and the commercial side of the business. Exactly. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Captain. Uh, Louis, uh, sorry to keep you waiting, but uh, would love to hear uh, from the global lens uh, what you are seeing in the direct impact of the business. Great, thank you for that. Um, yeah, so I think our experience right now is probably very similar to what Katrine shared uh, in that we work in a similar way. Our organization was founded uh, at the end of 2017 in direct response to the formation of um, targets and goals that were being set, environmental targets and goals being set uh, as sort of a global platform, particularly science-based targets initiative to reduce climate, um, impact of the apparel industry, looking at uh, other areas of water, chemistry, and material impact. And so our, our organization works um, with brands and retailers to scale impact solutions, typically in the form of project finance, where we're looking at which programs have proven success in reaching those um, those impact metrics, and then we work with sort of a public-private partnership of aggregating the funding from brands, uh, philanthropic, government grant, and the manufacturers themselves to scale those projects and programs. So what that means for us right now is what we're seeing is obviously with manufacturing um, either slowing down or completely stopping in the regions where we're working. That means our programs have also stopped. And I think in many ways, uh, you know, the, the side benefit of taking this pause or moment of manufacturing is also mean that the, it gives us an opportunity to look at how we want to 
scale the kind of programming that once the pandemic is over and we are looking at uh, increasing production again, will we be uh, generating in the same way as before and how might we take a, a certain level of, um, of um, I guess, a, a moment to actually figure out how our programs can be best utilized to also um, ensure that the manufacturing facilities that are producing are going to be doing so in a way that's even more environmentally, uh, um, you know, meaning towards these targets, particularly I think right now as we're ensuring that um, science-based targets initiative and UN charter goals around climate are being intact. But in terms of how we're seeing that impact rolling out right now, it's very similar, I think, to what Katrina was saying, which also means a lot of the projects and programs that we're looking to move from a pre-seed development phase into a pilot phase, we've just extended that timeline and we're use, utilizing this time to really ensure that we have the right data and the right research in order to um, move those programs into pilot when we can again. That's wonderful. Thank you, Louis. Um, and I guess one of the things that's kind of uh, running across all the feedback or all the points from each one of you is that um, is the aspect of how the fact that our supply chains in the industry are linked globally, right? And you all, uh, some of you also spoke about the uh, linkages and the interdependencies across India, Bangladesh, China, and so on and so forth. And some of the early reports that we saw, for example, there was this uh, report which the United Nations Conference for Trade and Development came up with in early March, in fact, exactly a month back, where uh, just from, a, from the early data points in Jan and Feb, where they estimated the extent of uh, impact just that could happen from just 2% contraction in the Chinese economy could have on the 20 next economies and the key industries within each of these economies. Now, there are several other reports, and I don't want to quote the statistics because we don't want to be prisoners of statistics, and we don't want numbers to tell us where we are and uh, where we need to go. But I guess the key point is that the global supply chains and the interlinkages uh, have always underlined the structure of the industry that we're operating in. So my next question, and I want to pick up that clue from what Stefan was mentioning earlier, is the question for you is, does this mean that or beyond when we try to imagine the industry or the business in the post-COVID world, would it mean that we will see a diversification of our supply chain organizations or will we see an increased movement or momentum around nearshoring and onshoring? And I could, I could actually uh, point this to Naresh, Catherine, and Louis to answer this question specifically. So maybe start with Naresh or start with Louis, in fact, this time around. Sorry. Louis, if you could go first on this one. Yeah, sure. I mean, this is a this is a, it's really interesting. As I've been talking with my team this week, I've I've said we have to be careful daily what we what we say and what crystal ball we pull out because by tomorrow we may completely change. The world is changing rapidly around this. Um, I, I do think there is a potential um, for some countries looking at uh, onshoring, uh, bringing manufacturing into more into more localized ways. Um, you know, for and and I'm sitting here looking through the lens of the United States, who has offshored most of its production, and yet there are still um, some remnants of of uh, um, garment stage production and dye houses. <laughs> And uh, mills in the U.S. that may still may may still continue to find themselves in a in an opportunity of of ramping up their business. But I think it's something that ultimately we don't see uh, the globalization of this industry shifting so dramatically that uh, we don't stay the course in terms of how we're designing our programs and how we're currently looking at which countries we're partnering and deploying or which regions we're addressing because. What AII, our organization, wants to do is look at um, climate change from a global perspective. So anywhere where production is happening and we're looking at scaling solutions, that's where we want to be. Secondarily, we, when we look at issues like water, 
we do not see uh, water scarcity or drought or issues of certain basins that need to be addressed changing dramatically because of this. So we still envision our work going into the areas where manufacturing is happening in those regions. Right. Thanks, Louis. Um, Naresh, uh, could I request you to weigh in on this question? Yeah, one could very interesting question at this juncture. Uh, though it's very challenging time and it's perhaps difficult to forecast because every day you find that uh, some management and change is happening. Supply right. chain is the uh, outcome of the change. I personally feel whatever I can uh, understand, there, is, there will be change in consumption pattern. And uh, that uh, SDG 12, sustainable consumption, is something I, I foresee to come in picture much more loudly. And that will definitely impact your uh, product portfolio and supply chain. But in terms of uh, supply chain moving from one geography to other geography, I don't think or I don't foresee that kind of drastic uh, diversion from Asia to somewhere else, because more right. or less uh, apparel and textile hub will remain more or less same. Only product right. diversification and extension may happen, right. but not really so much uh, change in supply chain. Maybe principle of supply chain will change, right. uh, but not uh, geography and location. Got it. Got it. Um, uh, Catherine, um, um, do you have any input on uh, the partners and the stakeholders that you work with? Uh, could you give us a sense of, uh, from that part of the world, what are some of those shifts that you're seeing <clears throat> in the conversations um, as this crisis is unfolding? Well, I think even before the crisis, there has been um, a strong interest with regards to new models of production um, from a perspective can it be near short to allow for on-demand production, for mass right. customization, um, 3D printing? So um, that was very much driven, you know, from one perspective, an environmental dimension, because you would avoid overstock, um, you would avoid transportation costs. So I think <laughs> that, will, um, that trend will remain and potentially even be accelerated. Will it lead to a complete, to, to Naresh's point, will it lead to a complete reorganization of the supply chain like what we've seen some some 30 years ago where everything was moved to Asia. Um, I, I'm not sure. I think this is not a question that only relates to the textile and, and fashion industry. I think we see these global industries in all um, sectors, be it electronics, um, be it food, etc. So I think what we will probably see is also from a governmental perspective is that um, high security um, or um, products of strategic importance, there will probably be a setup where local production, um, local inventory will also be um, increased. Just think of face masks, think of ventilators, probably those kind of um, very critical products, there will um, be a, a strong focus on, on rethinking what the production setup um, will be. Um, and I also liked um, Naresh's last point, next to the geographic dimension and where the supply chain sits, I think this, this shock and this crisis will, is also a good moment to reflect on the relationship between brands and suppliers. Um, how can more longer term relationships where stronger commitments also from brands um, can be put in place where a cancellation of order the way we've seen it in some of the cases will just not be um, the norm anymore. So I think the rethinking of that, of the supply chain and the relationships um, amongst the different stakeholders um, is an important reflection to also have next to the geographical dimension. Yeah, no, that's a critical point. And I think what I'm picking up is that it will not necessarily um, the change if it happens or how much that change happens in the supply chain organizations will not be a factor merely of the geographical dimension, but it will perhaps be in terms of how we work and how we partner with our suppliers uh, upstream or downstream in the value chain. That's number one. And I think second, what I love about 
um, what Naresh uh, mentioned or what I want what I want to pick up from Naresh's point was that it might actually lead to change in consumption behavior. And I think that would be perhaps be uh, a, a welcome change that we all could uh, could leverage as different players in that ecosystem. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit here, right? Um, we started off and the topic per se was about the, um, the fact that it's not just merely a health crisis or an economic crisis, of course, but um, we've got to be conscious, no matter who we are in this, in this particular audience, whether we are on the panel or whether we are in the audience background, but it's very evident that this particular crisis, first and foremost, is turning out to be a humanitarian crisis, right? Um, and from the first question that we had in the conversation, we've spoken about how this is really impacting the people that who are working for us, the artisans, the workers, <laughs> different communities, the vulnerable communities, and the groups that are part of the value chain. So I want to bring back the conversation to that focus, right? Now, we know and we don't need the numbers to tell us how much or what percentage of our value chains have employed women. We don't need numbers or we don't need a reminder of how much uh, the contract workers and the migrant workers, what kind of role and significant role at that they played in the value chains in the ecosystem, right? Now, um, perhaps one of you was almost alluding to it a little earlier, and I want to bring back the point is that if you look at the ways in which the current pandemic is hitting systems which are already battered, it's hitting systems which are already broken. It's hitting systems, whether they are financial systems, whether they are governmental systems, whether they are, um, you know, emergency response systems. But what we are seeing across, and this is not India, but across uh, several geographies around the world, perhaps, is that in the response to mitigate the impact of this pandemic, we are seeing, or we have, this, this particular crisis has brought to surface more than ever perhaps, that there is a huge and glaring disparity economically and socially, right? So I want to bring back the conversation to that particular point. And I want to talk about how these workers, the migrant workers, the contraction workers, the home based uh, government workers, who have been such an integral part of value change in the industry, uh, they are already reeling under some of the governmental initiatives like demonetization and GST, specifically in India. From as recent as last week, we've seen, and some of you touched upon the aspect of cancellation of orders and how that could potentially, or how this crisis could potentially redefine the relationships um, and the partnerships that we drop within supply chain. Now, in Bangladesh alone, uh, from last week, just from cancellation of orders, we've seen the extent of unemployment and the loss of livelihood that has driven. So my question to start with is, if I could point this to uh, some of you and I'll come back to that point. Could you tell us from the front lines, from the people that you're directly working with, whether it's the artisans or the garment workers or people in different parts of the value chain that you're working with, the vulnerable individuals, the vulnerable communities for part of the value chain. Could you share some frontline stories on how this crisis is impacting them as we speak. And we're not just talking in terms of the economic aspect, we're talking about the social and the humanitarian aspect, right? And here, if I could get Ipshita to take the lead on uh, this particular aspect. Thanks, Venkat. I was waiting to weigh in when we're going to also uh, touch upon the topic, which is on the impact on vulnerable communities. Um, I mean, the immediate impact has been purely humanitarian, right? It has become a disaster management sort of um, um And that we're all aware about. It says my internet connection is unstable, but I don't know if, if everyone can hear me. We can hear you as we can. Okay, perfect. Um, but kind of moving beyond the imminent, um, I want to highlight some of the incredible work that our partners are doing on the field. Um, they are trying to create opportunities wherever available in linking workers to existing government safeguards that exist. 
um, to existing social security opportunities in India. Say, for example, um, there's a collective appeal that's currently being made by uh, worker organizations throughout the country to the prime minister's office to sort of dip into funds that are sitting in the employee employment social insurance schemes in lieu of wages that workers are losing. And that kind of brings to fore the importance of having formal social security safeguards. Um, we know, again, not singling out India, but globally, um, uh, the business model in the apparel sector is moving towards more informal worker relationships, towards more contractual jobs, also towards um, some of it subcontracting to home-based workers. And therefore, it's very important that in these segments where the formal social security nets do not exist, that we need to think about how that can be created in the post-COVID world. So right now, uh, while you know, there is an opportunity to kind of dip into the existing safeguards. Um, however, that opportunity only exists for formal workers. There has to be rethinking about um, how that can be connected to contractual workers, to home-based workers. Um, and therefore, the discussion that happened right now was very interesting to me because the question is um, that, you know, as we think of uh, shifting business models, <coughs> shifting geographies, are we also going to look within and kind of think of the inherent social contracts that we have within the supply chain? Do they need to be relooked at fundamentally? Is it a question of geographic shift or is it a question of uh, the way business is conducted right now and how that trickles down to the most vulnerable in the supply chain? Right. No, thank you. Uh, but it is, it is interesting, right? I mean, we talk about, because we're all talking about sustainability and move towards a circular um, industry, right? And, um, and I guess we make this um, uh, perhaps subconsciously where we make this distinction that when we're thinking of business models, we're actually not factoring the human aspects. Now, when we talk about circularity and sustainability, perhaps it's a good reminder for all of us and uh, on the panel as well as the audiences that are listening in that when we talk about circular business models or business models which are more in tune with the sustainable development goals and the whole agenda or driving the agenda towards circularity, inclusion and social aspects are actually a key pillar of that. So you can't, one, can't claim to be a circular model or a circular business if you haven't factored the social and inclusion aspect. So um, let me um, uh, reach out to Sangeeta, if she could go in, because Sangeeta, we know that the House of Anita Dongre has already lost a medical fund to, um, as a relief for some of the artisans and the work women that you work, the craftsmen that you work with. Uh, could you share a little bit more about, from the front lines, uh, you're obviously known for the work that you do around women empowerment. Uh, if you could share some stories and some of the interventions that you're putting in place, to help mitigate the risks for, uh, from a social angle or from a humanitarian angle um, with your workers. Sangeeta, you're on uh, mute. You'll have to unmute yourself. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, so, um, as far as uh, workers are concerned, our uh, employees who work directly under us are all covered under a fixed salary. They are not on a daily wage basis at all. Right. So they get their salaries and uh, they're all covered under medical insurance. While uh, besides our own employees, we also work with a lot of artisans across the country, several uh, smaller job workers, etc., across the country. And we also have some uh, you know, CSR units where we have uh, women from villages working over there. So as far as these are concerned, what we've, uh, we've been in touch with uh, most of them and uh, most of them are, you know, the owners of the factories, etc. They have ensured that uh, the workers, the carigars are getting food to eat. They're looking after their day to day, at least, you know, expenses as far as food is concerned. In fact, they are providing food to all these people. As far as medical is concerned, we've, we've put in uh, an X amount in a fund where we would reach out to, we would, we would help anybody 
from our supply chain who would need uh, you know their medical expenses uh, to be dealt with so we've rolled out this to everybody and uh, they can all get in touch with it, get in touch with us for this okay thank you uh, stefano um, uh, i know we've uh, in the last couple of weeks and we've spoken uh, um, and you also mentioned here about uh, the impact that it had with the the craftsmen that you work with, the shutdown of the businesses, the absolute stop on the business and the work that you're doing, how much that has impacted. So could you talk to us about some of those uh, interventions that uh, we were discussing? Yeah, uh, clearly we are uh, a much smaller uh, organization, uh, company. Uh, we are 200 people. Uh, there are uh, 180 at least coming from uh, vulnerable, uh, background. So the the first measure, uh, the first measure that we we put in place is actually to uh, secure the salary of everybody. You have to keep in mind that out of the 200 people, uh, there are around 25 to 30 that are uh, employed, uh, either by us uh, or by uh, our uh, partners that are dedicated to our project, and 170 plus are basically artisans uh, working, uh, uh, they are paid per piece, or in any case, they are not formally uh, employed. And uh, the decision we have taken is that, uh, and we have uh, communicated to all the, uh, the staff, to all the stakeholders, is that we are going to secure their salary uh, for March, although uh, we stop our operation on the 17th, so just uh, uh, sort of mid of the month. Uh, mm. And also for April, we, we wanted really to reassure everybody that they don't have to worry that they will get basically uh, their stipends, their salaries, even if they will not be productive, because we are absolutely aware that this is out of their control and we don't want them uh, to pay the highest price uh, and uh, so we again we are a completely self-funded uh, initiative uh, so uh, there is a limit to the resources we can put but uh, our decision is that uh, resources will be primarily used in order to secure the salary of all the staff and, uh, and, and the artisans and uh, so even if the lockdown will continue uh, longer than, than April. Uh, we have uh, secured some resources, thanks to the performance also of the last financial year, uh, in order to be able to uh, support them. Uh, we are also in contact with uh, our key suppliers, especially the ones coming from the informal sector, uh, in order to see if there is any, uh, any special need, any way uh, in which we can uh, uh, we can support them. Right. No, Stefano, that's uh, that's really wonderful, and uh, one can only imagine that if you hadn't given them the assurance that um, they have the financial net and the safety of staying back in Mumbai, one can only imagine that um, if they had um, started this journey back during this crisis, back to the villages, like uh, a lot millions and millions of workers uh, from the north have done. Um, it's, it's unimaginable the kind of risk and exposure they would have put themselves to. So I uh, appreciate the work that you've done. And uh, so I want to pick um, a question that's coming in from, uh, from our audience in the background and they picked up one aspect which, uh, which you mentioned, Naresh, which is the fact that uh, you said that you might actually see some or we might see changes in consumption patterns. Now, um, the audience obviously, and we all know this, and we've uh, heard uh, quite a bit of this um, through our work on a day-to-day -day basis, that sustainable products have always seemed to be more expensive than virgin products, right? So the question to the audience is, number one, um, how much or what kind of changes are you actually going to, or do you think will come about in consumption habits? That's number one. And number two is, um, do we feel that with the current uh, conditions and the circumstances 
and uh, to take uh, uh, Gigi's word, the quarantine on consumption, would that actually lead to some form of responsible consumption and move towards being able to look at sustainable products beyond just the price aspect? Yeah, Venkat. Uh, thanks. Uh, I mean, in terms of sustainable consumption, it's more about responsible consumption. Right. And uh, in responsible consumption, my own experience, I think uh, in last 10-15 uh, days, what I have experienced, I mean, right. people have not heard the word called PPE. Right. And now everyone knows what is PPE. The right. company which used to make a missile is now making ventilator. The company like us, which used to make garment, now we are making mask. Right. We have taken commitment to make that uh, one million mask and uh, two lakhs piece of uh, coveralls. We never right. thought we will be doing this kind of thing. So I think right. in the last 15 days, what I myself have experienced as an individual, as a citizen, and same time, what I see as a part of which big business house or retail company, I'm just trying to articulate that. So I think first and foremost, uh, priority which I've seen is health and healthcare. Right. And when I say healthcare, healthcare talk about even uh, not only PPE, but it talk about that garment also. People will right. be more conscious what they need to buy and what they need to be wear. Because suddenly that uh, health has come into picture of everywhere, and uh, right. that is that will remain at least, uh, and that will at least impact that uh, pattern in terms of consumer preference and buying and longevity and usability in terms of. Second point, I think that uh, all that society, what I'm seeing, business as a responsible business, not only environment, actually social is coming very much into picture. Taking right. care of society, taking care of people, because you are taking care of all your employees working from home or in shutdown period for your economy, economy security as well as uh, health security. Right. Uh, just to give you an example, in our village where we work, 40,000 people, we have done thermal scanning and provided the mask. Right. In normal routine business, we would not have taken that as a top priority. Even right. So now a lot of balance in terms of business priority, business model, and uh, right. preference in terms of what <laughs> to be uh, done in terms of consumption as a responsible consumption. Material right. or sustainable material may be one of the small component in that. But here right. I'm referring more as a responsible consumption. The right. third point which I see, because you know that uh, Every, everyone, especially in that uh, whole globe, uh, every individual is at home. And in right. home, you have been forced and pushed to be in isolation. This isolation is actually pushing people to collaborate more. So in that kind of contradictory thing, I feel that the more and more collaboration is going right. to come in terms of sustainability and business perspective. Right. Sustainability earlier used to be a separate subject or a department. Now people will start talking about sustainable business, which is right balance between environment, economy, and uh, society. That's a wonderful narration. I want to pick that last point because one of the fears that we are seeing, and these are all conversations that we've had in the last couple of weeks with some of you and some of our ecosystem partners as well, is that one of the fears of this particular pandemic is that in that future, whenever we are um, in, in, a, in, in some of the words that we tend to use, saying that when life gets back to normal, one of the biggest fears for all of us in whatever capacity and roles that we play and whatever work we do with our organization, the fear that sustainability agenda will probably take a backseat to other business priorities. And I think Catherine, you probably alluded to that uh, a little while ago. And if I could come back to you and on, on this particular question saying, how could we ensure, I mean, we look at, if you look at the panel, we play very diverse roles. We come from organizations that have a very good representation and we're doing some fantastic work collectively. So the question is, 
how do we ensure that individually and collectively we make sure that sustainability does not get lost to other business priorities the moment we're back into this uh, because all these kind of uh, situation actually one side you get uh, a lot of panic in your mind how we will survive and how that whole industry uh, will strive after that but same time i think crisis uh, always come with lot of innovation and lot of different thought right and uh, i personally feel this is the best time you will find lot of innovation coming in next one month and two month and uh, to to have that uh, i think uh, it's not about uh, uh, organization or it's not about it's more about that sustainable business how as a business how as a community that everyone will be uh, sustaining in short term short term is definitely there is panic and you need to address thing on emergency but long term people always think that sustainability is too far suddenly that uh, this kind of uh, pandemic that too far become to to too much near you yeah and the uh, sustainability i think people will start uh, looking into more sustainable business rather than sustainability as a part of somewhere in business that's wonderful and uh, uh, gg uh, sorry and uh, that is uh, i think uh, i feel that uh, uh, forum like uh, kf or people like us like minded people uh, we have to create a lot of optimism we have to create right. an ecosystem to bring right. value add everywhere to get uh, i think how in this uh, situation we right. get to that uh, new normal and definitely new normal will not be all normal it will be different so how we bring that innovation and change what i keep hearing in so many forum systematic change i think this right. is the best time next 6 month is the time to bring that change sustainability as a forefront to be called as a sustainable business not as a sustainability as a subject that uh, that's a good positive note naresh uh, if i could uh, look to gg to want to add to, to that how do we make sure that the Uh, the ecosystem stakeholders the partners the enterprises that we work with we make sure that sustainability does not get lost in the top priority agenda gg you're on mute yeah thanks venkat i agree with everything naresh said you know sometimes i mean this is a question we need to ask ourselves whether the present crisis is actually the breakthrough that sustainability was wait, waiting for you know everything right. that we have worked for whether it's slow fashion or you know when it comes to waste consumers will become more conscious about their consumption you know uh, and uh, sustainability will not at least uh, with the scenario that i'm seeing that could evolve sustainability will just not be a csr uh, agenda but will be business as usual so um this is something that i see um, you know very positively and the glimmer of hope that i see is that the new normal will be um you know like like naresh said uh, systemic change or um, you know conscious consumption um so so this is something uh, we it, it, the kind of opportunities and also the explosion of innovation and ideas that you will see opening up um right. you know, and business is getting more agile lesser dependence right. and i'm not saying that they may move away from uh, you know whoever they depending in in their supply system but it's going to be more smarter way of doing things so i see a, a lot of opportunities opening up and how are we going to ensure that this doesn't take a back seat and is not a, a second hand agenda is collaboration is working together with partners because it's not going to be a flamboyant word anymore collaboration but you know joining together all of us right on a similar platform lobbying with the government to bring in relief packages or um, you know working with funders working with partners so i think it's a huge opportunity out there uh, with the new normal like collections you know collections and seasons with brands are going to be longer that is going to bring in slow fashion so it's an, it's an amazing uh, opportunity that i see unfolding before us fantastic uh, louis uh, would love to hear your perspectives on um, what are some of the conversations that you're having um, 
in US from a global perspective and how are we ensuring that uh, we don't lose uh, our eye of the sustainability agenda? Hi, Louis. Sorry, you're on mute. There we go. I think it led me off. Yeah, once again, I think that the speaker before me uh, says some wonderful points. And uh, Gigi, I love I love a lot of what you said. I think, you know, this is the this is an interesting time where we're seeing um, keeping our, our, our eye on the ball and really trying to ensure that our work and our mission is staying um, is maintaining its path. But at the same time, I think this is an extremely interesting time where where disruption is going to come out of, a, of of this time. And one of the things that I think AII is looking even more increasingly at is, you know, the the ways in which we don't want to necessarily return to the same type model. I mean, right now we're talking about a couple of weeks or months that we've been in this position, but as we roll this clock forward by a month or a year and look at uh, what that will culturally, how that will culturally impact the world, and I think certainly in the U.S., um, you know, and I was reading a McKinsey report that was looking uh, this week at the uh, impact on online retail in Europe. And I think that uh, I'd be interested to see what that is this week in the United States, too, because I think uh, people are not necessarily going to emotional shopping. They're, you know, they're really looking at um, necessities and things that they need. And that's layering in almost like in, in other times in the period of history in the United States, the Great Depression of the 1930s really impacted our grandparents and parents' generation, and I think that's something that uh, there's talk now about how this will impact uh, the youth of today in their relationship to um, apparel, but really, you know, all products and our relationship to all products. Perfect. No, thank you so much, Louis. Um, Catherine. As an ecosystem enabler, as an ecosystem builder like ourselves, um, what are some of those positive stories that we're sending out to make sure that we're not taking eye off the ball, as Louis mentioned? Yeah, well, I think um, indeed such a crisis provides for an amazing opportunity to, to really rethink um, the future that we want to live in. And I overall, I would point out three three key arguments that we should all jointly in a you know collaborative way also reiterate to the various stakeholders um, that are important to consider to keep the momentum with regards to sustainable um, sustainability and, and circularity. The first one is that um, innovation and the continuous focus on innovation is a core driver towards circularity but also towards economic resiliency. If you think about the past crisis, 2008, companies that continued to innovate were the strongest ones um, uh, and emerges in the strongest um, way after the crisis. So if you take this analogy, investing in circularity now, investing in those innovations now will allow companies to emerge, emerge stronger after, after the crisis. And um, circularity clearly is not a, an investment that, you know, is a short-term quick win it demands patience but you can have patience but you can have outsized returns from a environmental from a human but also from an um, economic perspective so i think this really is a is a rare catalyzation moment that um, that we are in now um, that we should drive the industry towards to to not miss this opportunity so innovation remains important to really drive this this transformation i think the second point was touched upon um earlier in the discussion mostly with um with naresh i truly think that um consumer behavior will be different after that crisis um and there will be an increased concern around how do companies um you know treat social issues treat environmental issues um the purpose of, of companies so i think the ones that have already and we've seen in 2019 so many organizations committing to circularity committing to a sustainability agenda changing course um for those companies clearly risks them seriously damaged in their in their reputation and in their purpose um perception so i think being ready to address this new consumer concern post-crisis is really important. And the third one I would point out, and we're seeing this a lot here in Europe, 
um, regulatory pressure will continue to um, demand change. Um, we've seen that on the side of plastics, textile just has um, various regulatory dimensions um, in the making. So being prepared um, to meet those regulatory demands is, is also um, leading to stay committed on the journey towards sustainability, circularity, et cetera. So those three points I would um, bring up in every conversation um, to lead it towards leadership, to not lose course of the long term whilst we're fighting short term issues. Wonderful. Thank you, Catherine. So here's a question and we want to, we are taking in a question from, um, question from the audience. Um, we, we've got 10 minutes, so I would request you to kind of keep it short and crisp. The question from Bridget Mulder is this, how do we make sure that the manufacturers and brands are still incentivized to partner and collaborate with the innovators? How do we make sure that the manufacturers are incentivized to invest in innovations and invest in disruptive sustainable innovations? How do we make sure? Naresh, let's start with you. Can you like to repeat the question? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so the question is from Bridget Mulder, and her question is How do we make sure that manufacturers and brands are incentivized enough to continue to partner with innovators and invest in disruptive sustainable innovation? Yeah. Uh, if you see that uh, all that value chain, I think innovation comes from different pocket. Right. And no single company can do that innovation there alone. Uh, alone, alone. Right. So you need to have ecosystem and you need to have that uh, because I realize that uh, uh, innovation come much faster in a small company and when individual is innovating. A startup and uh, innovator play very big role to bring faster change. So if you have that ecosystem where you can uh, get uh, access to these innovation, uh, you can adopt it faster. Right. You can facilitate it to scale up. Right. And you can bring wherever you need to bring, be it uh, back end supply chain or manufacturing or front end side, wherever possible, you can bring that uh, facilitation and change faster with that ecosystem. So I think. Right. Uh, this uh, two three month is very very crucial to get facilitation and uh, acceleration in terms of some solution right which will take it to i would say not again in bucket into that uh, material or supply chain but whatever is relevant in this uh, uh, coming out of this uh, short uh, pandemic situation uh, right. Can you have quick win? Can you have quick solution which will facilitate and help business res resilience to come back? Right. And uh, all that value chain, be it back end or front end, people to right. survive and uh, thrive uh, to the again to that uh, business what it used to be earlier. So I think a lot of innovation is required in that. Brilliant. I love the fact that you still see a relevance and probably a higher importance and significance for the role of an ecosystem. Now, the question to all of you, and we are in the last six minutes of this panel, but the question to all of you. Now, we are, um, as CI as an industry-led platform, we are committed. We have set ourselves an ambitious mission of building the ecosystem, plugging the gaps in the ecosystem, building the capabilities to really make this progress towards a net zero emission or a circular industry. The question to you is, what is it that we can do as an ecosystem to learn from this crisis? And what is it that we can do to, to facilitate, to put together those unusual partnerships and those unusual solutions to make sure that we are driving the innovations, we are committed to innovations, and making sure that sustainability remove, remains as a top priority in the industry. So I'm going to start with, uh, from the bottom of my screen here, um, if I could start with uh, Lewis. What can we do as an ecosystem to learn from this crisis? Lewis, sorry, I'm still, you're on mute. 
Yeah, there, there seems to be a delay in the unmuting, but I think it's done now. There is a bit of a yeah. delay. So my, my question is, what can we do as an ecosystem to collaborate and really yeah. move and make progress towards a net zero emission economy? So if all of you could come up with, let's say, one concrete idea that we could potentially take forward. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think what we what we can do is to really use utilize this time to be innovative and to pilot things, whether it's a technology or a new innovation that, that may be coming out of an, something like Fashion for Good or whether it's a new project or program. I think now is the time where we can collaborate to really identify some things we can we can take risks on. Wonderful. Catherine, what would be one concrete way for us to collaborate as an ecosystem? Um, I mean, Lewis just had such a, such a beautiful point. You took, <laughs> you took my idea because obviously that's yeah. what we're continuing yeah. to do to, to really, um, in the, um, with the resources that we have continue to support those innovators and, um, plan as much as we can also, um, to make it easy for brands and manufacturers to really, um, um, plug in into those solutions. The, I think overall, we're still in the learning phase. We're now here week three in, um, or week four in um, really experiencing those um, implications of COVID-19. There is probably not a silver bullet solution that I, that I have now top of my mind. I think what I would appreciate is that we continue to have those discussions, um, Venkat, what you've set up today as a, as a call to explore and to hear the different perspectives also with other um, convening organizations to identify what are the most useful um, levers to potentially pull that um, we could jointly also implement. Lovely, thank you. Ipshita, what would you think of as one concrete uh, way that we could collaborate as an ecosystem? And I would guess that you definitely look at it from the social and the human angle, but that would be fantastic. Um, absolutely. That's the only thing I'm equipped to comment because we have so many experts here who are already, um, you know, experts on, uh, say, mitigating for GHG emissions. Um, collaboration is the key, especially when we're thinking about the vulnerable con communities in our supply chain. Um, I honestly do not know what innovation can drive in this aspect. I would love to learn, not just from our fellow panelists here, but from the audience, the collective wisdom of the audience. But in our mind at the Loudest Foundation, there has to be a very strong policy and regulatory frameworks that can support vulnerable communities at this point. That support could come in the ma manner of strengthening social safeguards. That support could come in the manner of guarantee mechanisms that protect vulnerable communities. Um, it could be public-private partnerships. It could be purely regulatory in nature. These are all open to exploration. But the key here is collaboration. So I would tend more towards collaboration than innovation as part of our solution from the Loudest Foundation. Fantastic. Sangeeta, what could be one way that we could collaborate as an, uh, as an ecosystem and learn from this crisis? Sangeeta, you're on uh, mute. And maybe Gigi, you could go while uh, Sangeeta... Yeah, okay, I'm done. Uh, I would say more of... Uh, okay. I, I would... Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. We can hear you, Sangeeta. Yeah, yeah. I would also think the government needs to play an important role in coming up with uh, policies and interventions. Uh, for example, in Cambodia, the government is uh, paying 20% of the salaries of uh, workers and uh, the employer is paying 60% of the salaries. So if the government is more involved, I, I think one would be safeguarding the interests of the workers. Fantastic. Uh, Gigi? Yes, Venkat, I think uh, we need to be, uh, what we need to be doing is exactly what we are doing, but doing it collectively. Uh, whether, right. uh, whether it means actually, uh, you know, starting public-private partnership that is getting government involved, getting the brands involved, getting partners involved. Um, I think that's, that's the need of the hour. And the fantastic platform that CAIF is already, you know, making sure of, making sure these dialogues continue. I think, um, and also bringing the audience, not just the panel, but imagine bringing 300 people, you know, actually that can make a change in this. So fantastic. CAR. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Gigi. Stefano, sorry to keep you waiting, mate. Oh, I, I think I'm now uh, 
Sorry, could you be a little louder, Stefano? Uh, Let me see. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So in our case, we, we really see ourselves uh, as a collective. We have been from the very beginning. So we would not exist today if it were not for the fact that we are part of an ecosystem. And uh, this experience clearly will push us uh, even more in this direction. We, we are open to partnership. We are open to uh, share what we know and we rely very much on support from, uh, uh, from other partners uh, in order to help us, uh, in order to, to, to scale our, uh, our business. What I expect is that uh, the experience we are going through is really going to uh, push many more organizations, uh, many more professionals, many, many more individuals in order to uh, work in this way. So I, I think that this is going to be one uh, of the positive uh, effect of the experience we are, we are really going through. Fantastic. I mean, that's, that's a lovely to hear the fact that you know, all of us spoke about collaboration, all of us spoke about this being the right moment for innovation, all of us spoke about the relevance for us continuing to do and a lot more of it collectively together uh, and partnering uh, a lot more as an ecosystem. Well, that's, that's fantastic for us and you can be sure that from CIF, um, you will hear from us and we will reach out to you. This conversation is not just the one and a half hours that we spent discussing and hearing several perspectives. You can be sure that we reach out to you, reaching out to you, post this conversation, and explore those unusual solutions and partnerships that we spoke about. Number one. Number two is from the audiences that have been listening to us in the background. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the patience and sending in your questions. But please do reach out to us even after this conversation, and we will also reach out to you, each one of you on the panel as well as the members in the audience as well to make sure the collaborations and the innovations and the unusual public-private partnerships that we spoke about, that we are going to drive them and drive them a lot faster. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we've gone a little over time than what we, we had allocated for the panel, but uh, really appreciate each one of you making time uh, for this conversation. A special shout out to Lewis again for joining in the call at 2 a.m. in the morning from the Pacific Coast. Um, Catherine, thank you so much for joining in. Uh, Ipshita, lovely to have you. And uh, while you said that you were not equipped to answer a lot of the other questions, but uh, the lens that you brought in on the social aspect uh, was really good and uh, very well required. Stefano, thank you so much. Um, Gigi, once again, always good to hear uh, your points. You're always on point and you Always uh, make a great case for sustainability. Sangeeta, thank you so much. Uh, we probably lost Naresh at here at here to rush into another meeting, but thank you again. Uh, feel free to reach out. Um, but either ways, we will definitely reach out to all of you, and we look forward to a very good, busy, productive next few weeks and months to make sure that we continue on this agenda that we set out and so on. Well, thank you so much, Venkat, for thank your you. brilliant moderation and to the whole audience. Thank you so much, Catherine. Bye. Thank Bye, you everybody. so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye.